Internet, I'll introduce myself. <clears throat> My name is Dave Dietrich. Uh, I work at the University of Washington. Um, I've been in, uh, a member of the Magnetar Project since the very early days. I've been in the situation of trying to understand how to deal with these large distributed attacks since 1999 when the first distributed denial service attack tools came out. Uh, they were, it was very challenging to try and deal with those because hundreds of sites literally are involved in the same thing. There's command and control that's spanning all of those different parties. And, you know, in a situation like that where you have a large number of sites that are involved, some have skill and capacity to respond, some don't, some have no idea what to do, they'll try and give you the root account, password, and have you clean up. So you have to try and figure out how do you go about dealing with this in a situation where you may have to do things that sort of hit the line of what may be legal, what may not be legal, and how do you do this stuff in an ethical manner. I started studying ethics in 2003-2004. I've been kicking into this a little bit more in the last couple of years. And to get a little bit more familiar with the whole process, I've actually been a member of the University of Washington's Institutional Review Board. How many people here do not work in an academic institution who are researchers in private sector? Okay about half, or a little bit more than half. How many of those who are academics have gone to an institutional review board or some kind of an ethical review board with their work? Yeah. So very few people here are familiar with that process, and it does not apply to all of us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about we need to get aggressive. What does that mean when we're going to try to do things that are more aggressive? What does that apply? How does ethics fall into this? How can we use that as a way to make sure that what we do is viewed by the general public as something that's good? and not something that's bad. We're doing this for a reason, for certain people. I don't need to go into the details. We all understand that the threat is getting more sophisticated. It has been. The tools themselves are very complex. They change very rapidly. So if we're trying to respond to these things, we need to be able to respond as quickly as we can. There are botnets that have been out there that have been active sometimes for multiple years. There may be groups that have been active for almost a decade in various ways. And we may or may not understand who they are and exactly how they're working. And we see more and more people are calling for more aggressive action. There are botnet takedowns that happen or takeovers. Uh, you may not be able to read the, the details of this, but Torpig is mentioned, Mega D, the Makolo takedown. Uh, one thing that you will recognize is when these kinds of acts happen, the media picks up on it very quickly and they make a big deal out of it. So what may seem like it's not that big a deal to us, we're doing things in an ethical way, we'll get turned into hack back on the bad guys. And other really sensationalized things, spying, there was a point in time where an interview of some honey researchers turned into we spy on people. And the word spy will cause a lot of people who don't understand about computers to start having reactions about their privacy being violated. So if we're trying to do good for people and they think we're doing bad, we have trouble. The value proposition here is if we start thinking about ethical standards or an ethical code of conduct, we can get a situation where the things that we do are informed by agreed upon standards within the community that we can very clearly define what acts are beneficial acts, what acts are harmful acts, who is involved, who may be harmed, who is benefiting. And for those of us that work in an academic institution where we're required to undergo review, it helps us. For people who are submitting papers, more and more program committees are going to be requiring some kind of ethical statement, a good one, and we'll need to know how to deal with that. Uh, anybody here ever present at SOUPS or go to SOUPS, the Symposium on Usable Security and Privacy? This year, for the first time, they're requiring that all papers have an ethical statement, and that will be part of how the papers are accepted and how they're judged. So this is one of the first symposiums that's actually requiring that. And this little Venn diagram here, we're going to fall into one of these circles. When we publish results, they're picked up on by the general population. So there will be people out there who have the same technical capabilities as us. I'm, I'm sorry, David, if I could interrupt. So, so what, 
What is an in that ethical statement? They harm no bits? <laughs> um, their main thing is, if you're an academic, say that you have IRB approval for what you've done, or that you've at least gone to an IRB and consulted, even if it's minimal risk. And if not, they want a clear statement of what was your intent, what procedures did you use. You, know, you have to have considered ethics in some way. And their primary way is saying, because the majority of them are academics, we have gone and discussed this with an institutional review board. Um, really, really quickly, a lot of the research that's going on in scalability, network performance, etc., has privacy implications, and that's the main thing that people key in on. I don't want you spying on me if you're looking at network traffic across the border. The problem area that we have, we tend to be involving, or we tend to be researching things that involve crime. And if we're going out and doing civil attacks or botnet takedowns, there is criminal activity that law enforcement is looking at. We may actually be having an effect on other researchers polluting their data. We may be having an impact on law enforcement investigations. And if our goal is to benefit society and law enforcement is there to protect society and we make their job harder, do we get the benefit we think we're getting? Uh, one other thing that we need to think about that's a little bit different than other kinds of research. Quite often, you see a crime or some kind of criminal act, you research it, you publish. There's a lot of theoretical research. Let's, post let's postulate what the ultimate botnet would be. What kind of command and control would it have? What kind of encryption? Publish that. That could actually lead to better crime. And there are cases where we are researching crime, we publish the results, and it immediately gets used by bad guys. So we have to think a little bit differently than if you're researching some kind of uh, biological pathogen. The main thing with this diagram that I want to point out here is if you are doing research on liver disease, the liver is in a human body, you have to interact with the human in order to observe the liver. That's where most medical uh, or institutional review boards look at things is in a clinical kind of setting how are you explaining to these subjects who are patients with a disease what things are going to do to them what the risks are and then they agree to be involved in the research if they don't like the risks that you're presenting to them they have the ability to opt out that may not be the case with a lot of the research that we do because the person is over here we're looking at the bot. We're looking at the command and control. The only thing that we may be able to see is an IP address. There's a computer there. The person uses the computer. The computer may be involved in financial transactions. It may be involved in process control. So if we disrupt this thing, we hurt the innocent victim. The bad guy, we may be researching them as well, but we've also got to get to them by going through the computer owned by this person. So it completely flips the situation around, and the term is impracticable in terms of identifying these people and getting consent from them, or having them say, no, I don't want to be involved in this. So that's a hugely different kind of situation than with medical research. Um, so ethics are just this code that we live by. It can be a religious code. It can be just sort of the societal norms that are developed because people live together for a while and everybody agrees there's this certain thing that you do not do and if you do it, you get shunned. So most of them have some sort of a, you do this stuff for the betterment of society. That there is some kind of a beneficial or cost benefit involved in this and it provides for a foundation of trust. You believe that people are going to act a certain way, so you don't have to be on guard all the time. And there are a couple of different ethical philosophies that sort of come to the fore primarily. I'm going to use the torture debate because that's been something that people have been talking about for several years, and there are two main arguments that go on here. In deontology, you look at the acts themselves, and you judge whether those acts are good or they're not good, and you say, for everybody, all the time, everywhere, 
torture is bad. Consequentialism looks at the outcome. So it's not the act itself, but what do you get from doing this act? So the ends justify the means is a term that people see all the time. If you get this positive outcome from torture, it saves lives of many. Those are sort of in conflict. There's another form of ethics that people look at that looks more at the person who's doing the act. So is this person virtuous? Is it someone who has exhibited trust in the past, who I believe is a good person, and so if they're going to do something, if I trust them, they think that this is something that has to be done, it's okay. So that's possibly the kind of uh, situation that we sometimes get in as researchers. We're looked at as the good guys. We're the ones who are trying to do something good for society. And then there's this thing called ethical relativism. So I said that the ethics are sometimes developed from the local community. So every culture has different reasons for coming up with their own norms. And generally, you agree that the norms of this society are the ones that should be respected within that society or within that region. The problem here is the internet spans the entire globe. So is it okay for us to impose country A's views on countries B through Z? Is there some way that we can come up with some sort of a universal agreement that this thing is always bad everywhere? And that's the problem with the relativists. They say everybody has to have their own way of coming up with their own uh, ethical norms, and they should all be respected. And so that argument basically says that there are no universal truths. Everybody has their own truth, but it's universally true that there is no universal truth. So there's sort of this conflict within relativism that uh, makes a lot of people say, you know, they're not really explaining things the right way. We really need to start thinking about this though because because the internet spans the globe, a lot of the things that we're starting to do now do have global impact. So what guides our decisions? Uh, there were at least three of us in here who have institutional review boards that we have to answer to. How many people here who are in professional societies like IEEE or ACM how many know that there's a code of conduct and B, think about it when you're trying to do your work, your, your research? So a few people. Um, as we'll see in a minute, that they don't necessarily cover everything. Uh, program committees have been debating these issues for quite a while. The problem with program committees is the discussion of papers is a private thing. You're not supposed to discuss review or rejection. So when someone's paper is rejected on ethical grounds, you won't learn about it. And that doesn't help in trying to train us how we should behave. And every program committee, you don't agree? No. Well, that's not part of the feedback in, in the paper review Absolutely. process? I mean, on a one by one basis. OK, so the comment was it's not part of the feedback. Yes, it is part of the feedback. To the individual who submitted, they will be told, perhaps, not always, your paper was rejected for a particular reason. Sometimes there will be other reasons that will be found to reject a paper, but the thing is, it would then be up to that person to say to everybody, my paper was rejected because I didn't do things right ethically. And that doesn't happen. The program committee will not normally go forward and say, we rejected some anonymous paper because it had ethical problems, because that might be exposing the person. Although they could publish statistics. They could publish statistics. Right, so program committees have ways of doing this, but they're all individual. They don't seem to be working together. There is an effort to try and deal with this problem, but it may be a long time before it's solved. Then we've got communities, our colleagues, uh, but the problem there is that everybody sort of has their own view, and so without stated uh, ethical norms, uh, that becomes a little spotty itself. So I'll just say that the three main problems here are that we don't share common values, that we don't have training that we all go through in ethics. Often it's just an elective course. How many people here have taken an ethics course? 